Hey everybody, welcome uh, to Heights Community Holy Week. Thank you for joining in with us this evening as we enter into a teaching on the Lord's Supper. Uh, something we started doing a few years ago and uh, our church really enjoyed it. We have many guests that tune in and so uh, thank you even to our guests who are tuning in with us uh, at Holy Week from all over the place. And so uh, in my personal study, I've been setting in the book of Hebrews uh, and the part of scripture in Hebrews that I keep coming back to over and over again is in Hebrews 3 and Hebrews talks about Jesus being the better Moses. Uh, and the writer tells us from the book of Hebrews uh, that Moses built the law, that he built the Old Testament, that he wrote the Torah. Uh, he tells us that Moses was the incredible builder and he was building out this house that we would call, a majority of it, the Old Testament. Uh, then the author of Hebrews says that there is a better builder and there's a better house that is coming, a builder that will remain forever and a house that will never be torn down. And the author is speaking of Jesus whenever he's making this comparison. He's saying what Moses had built was incredible and full of glory, and yet it was coming to an end. And there's this Jesus that is coming. He's a better builder to build a better house, and it's going to remain and last forever. And what happens in that moment is that the author in Hebrews lays out for us that this house that Jesus is building is obviously not just a, a house but rather it's a metaphor for the people of God, the church, the kingdom of God that is ever expanding and always advancing. And so everything that happened in the Old Testament happened to point to the need for Jesus and the birth of the church. Uh, the Apostle Paul, even in the book of Corinthians, reiterates this and he says the Old Testament or the Old Covenant was passing away. He calls it a ministry of condemnation. He calls it a ministry of death because it pointed to salvation by good works, which will never happen. And then he says, the Apostle Paul says that there's a better covenant that's coming. It's a ministry of the Spirit. It has been written on the hearts of men. What was once written on the hearts of stone has now been written on the hearts of men. The Apostle Paul is saying there is someone better, Jesus, and there is a better house that is being built, which is in fact the people of God. And so what I love about that is that for millennia then, everything that God was doing through himself, through Moses, now through Jesus, all of that was to build this better house. Um, this master builder, God the Father, has instituted all these little micro workers, if I may, to, to begin, continue building out the kingdom of God until we get to Jesus. Everything God did was re to reveal his unconditional, unchanging love and grace and mercy towards us. He's a good builder and he took the time, man, and he drew out the best floor plans that we could ever imagine. He drew out the best blueprints we could ever imagine. He staged everything perfectly. He set the scene um, for what that house would look like. Well, as we enter into the Lord's Supper, let's just pin some of that for just a minute. A new scene has been set. Uh, you have Jesus. He's come in, this perfect builder. He's lived the perfect life. He's done everything that he said he would do according to his word. And on this night of the Passover, he's come in, he's washed, washed the disciples' feet. He's literally sat the table for the Passover and they're sitting there getting ready to eat the Passover meal. So you might be thinking like, well, Corey, what is a Passover meal? What is that significance? Well, what happened here is during this week, Holy Week as we call it, Israelites would have came from all over the place. I mean, literally all over the world to gather together for Passover. They would have read from the Old Testament together. They would have read out of the book of Exodus and recalled the uh, Moses setting the people free, God setting the people free through Moses. They would have talked about the plagues. They would have talked about the angel that passed over the firstborn of Egypt and of Israel and left the sons alive for those who were obedient. They would have read through the Psalms. And just like we've been reading through the Psalms for so many weeks, they would have sang together just like we have sang together. It would not have looked a whole lot different than what we get to experience in a worship um, gathering together, except for it was communion in a house, similar to what you're having tonight. The Israelites would have delighted in all that God had done. They would have literally celebrated the master builder and all that he had accomplished to get them to this point. If you think about it, just kind of picture your eyes or shut your eyes and think about it. There would have been kids running around, grandkids running around, parents, grandparents. It would have been a party. It would have been a night to remember. It would have been a night that we would have enjoyed to be invited to. And yet, in the midst of all of this celebration, 
Jesus sits there, the true master builder of all things. All things exist for him, through him, by him. And he's looking at the ones that he came to build. He's looking at his brothers sitting around the table with him there. And he says this. And so if you could open up your Bible or open up your app to Matthew 26, 20 through 29. He says this. It says this. Verse 20. When it was evening, he, that's Jesus, reclined at the table with the twelve. And as they were eating, he said, Truly I say to you, one of you will betray me. And they were very sorrowful, and they began to say to him, one after another, Is it I, Lord? Is it I? Verse 23. And he answered, He who has dipped his hand in the dish with me will betray me. That would be a really awkward time to need to butter your roll. Yeah? Verse 24. The Son of Man goes as it is written of him. But woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed, Jesus says. It would have been better for that man if he had not been born. If he had not, you could say, been built. Verse 25. Judas, who would betray him, answered, Is it I, Rabbi? And Jesus said to him, You have said so. And so with all that Jesus has built, with all of the work, with all the labor that he has done, and all of the time, all the energy, all the commitment, all the grace, all the mercy, all the forgiveness, everything that Jesus has to do as the master builder of all things, coming to expand his kingdom, he has to sit there knowing that he's going to be betrayed. And not only that he's going to be betrayed, but betrayed by a kiss from his brother, whom he came to build, by the way, redeem, by the way. And what I love about this in this moment is when you think about all of that, like Jesus still took the time to eat with Judas in the midst of everything that is happening. This could have went so many different ways, and yet we see the compassion of Christ as Jesus ate with Judas on this evening. The builder took the time to see the imperfections of the house that he came to build. You could say even the homes that he has come to build. He saw the imperfections of the church that was being built. Keep in mind, of the, the church that's being built, out of the 12, the church is going to launch. One of those 12 is the one who's going to betray him and aim to deceive him. And what I love about this is instead of coming in hot, instead of coming in angry, Jesus just sits patiently with Judas. How can he do that? How can Jesus eat with Judas knowing he's going to be betrayed? Well, it's because the builder knows that in order for the kingdom of God to advance, in order for the church to be birthed, the builder has to receive the hammer and the nail. To fix the brokenness of the house, the builder himself must be broken. What contractor do you know that would do that? The builder himself has to be tore down and rebuilt. The builder, the one who has more glory, this Jesus, the one who has greater glory than Moses could have ever had, the one who should receive all of the credit, has come, has to come to receive no credit at all, but instead he comes to be scorned and judged in our place. Why would he do that? So that we and so that he could come together again in relationship with one another. So that this house that Hebrews mentions could continue to be built up so the church could be birthed, so that the kingdom of God could be ever expanding. This is ultimately then what Jesus says whenever he introduces communion for his people. Listen to this, verse 26 as we continue. It says, now as they, as disciples and others were eating, Jesus took bread and after blessing it, he broke it and he gave it to the disciples. And he said, take and eat, this is my body. This is an image of what I was leading us to in Hebrews chapter 3. We're talking about the builder. Here he's saying this master builder must be broken. This house, um, in order for the house of God to be built, the builder himself must be broken. Verse 27, and he took a cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink of this cup, all of you. For this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Now, what is Jesus doing? What he's doing is he's doing this. He's redefining all of the work that Moses had done. 
He's actually revealing his glory over Moses to everyone else. He's saying that the law, the Torah, the Exodus was all good and well, but it was always coming to an end. That the plagues that they were there to talk about and tell stories about, that the final plague even of the angel that passed over the firstborn in Egypt, Jesus is saying literally all of that was being built out to point to him. Everything was building to this moment. And in breaking the bread and redefining the cup, what Jesus is saying is this, I am the greater Moses, that I have come with greater glory for greater glory forevermore. Everything that they were selling was being rebuilt right before their eyes. Everything that they have been told was being remodeled right before their eyes. All of the stories that had come for millennia were living, literally given like new definition in this moment. It was given new life and given new color. Jesus was literally in that moment, church, redeeming every single aspect of the Old Testament for them. As it was not just a meal, a celebrated Passover. It was a redefining of literally everything that they knew. You could say it was a rebuilding of everything that they thought that they knew. It's incredible. And just as Jesus sat there patiently with Judas, so also then he continues and he says this, verse 29, I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. The builder has left the building then to us. He's saying, I'm going away, but I'm most certainly leaving you here. And for as good as you are and for as bad as you are at times, you are what I have come to build up and you are what I am going to use to expand my kingdom, right? Not solely us in and of ourselves, but by God's word and through God's spirit and hopefully to the glory of the Father, we get to continue building out the kingdom of God as we live on mission. And while we build, Jesus then is just waiting patiently for us, seated next to the Father, well, what does it look like then to be a Christian while we're just in this season of wait? Do we just profess faith in Jesus and then one day die and hopefully we get to go to heaven? Well, by no means. Rather, what we get to do then is we get to commune. We get to experience communion. We get to celebrate the redefining of the Lord's Supper. We literally get to set in repentance and faith. That is what communion is about. Repentance and faith is not something that the Christian does just one time. Uh, repentance and faith is not a track to be passed out where you get to profess faith. And repentance and faith is not just a sinner's prayer to be prayed one time, but rather it is the steps of the Christian. It is the very walk that we take, repentance and faith, and repentance and faith. And so communion affords us the opportunity to be built and to be rebuilt. Uh, at Heights, we'll often say that communion gives us the opportunity to be formed and reformed. In this case, built and rebuilt. And so as you go to the table this evening, we want to give you an opportunity to experience this rebuilding. We want to give you the opportunity to be reformed. We want to give you the opportunity to model confession and repentance, to actually step out in faith and believe the gospel that while it will hurt to confess and to repent, hopefully publicly with your brothers and sisters of the faith, that you can remember that Jesus ultimately received the hammer and the nail so that you just have to have a little bit of a sting for a moment and you can actually begin to look more and more like him. So there's two questions I want you to consider tonight as you gather together with your family, your missional communities. Two questions for you. What does God need to tear down within me? Just ask him, God, what do, what do you need to tear down within me? What looks more like Corey than looks like Jesus? Second question is, what does God need to rebuild anew in me? God, what do, you, what do you need to change? Like what would actually help me look more like Jesus than look like Corey? So what do you need to tear down within me? And what does God need to build anew in me? Maybe you're sitting there and you're really no different than Judas. Now you're sitting there with unconfessed sin towards a brother or towards a sister. Uh, perhaps you're sitting there and identifying with Judas in even more than one ways. And you can see greed kind of stirring in your heart and pride and arrogance in your heart. Maybe you've come into a Sunday morning service or Sunday morning gathering and you've dipped your bread over and over and over again and you've not confessed and you've not repented. And in doing so, you've actually found yourself hardened to the gospel and you take communion while others are celebrating and being moved. You find yourself not being moved and not finding celebration. Well, that's because you cannot celebrate what has not been redeemed. It is quite possible that maybe you have not been redeemed. And tonight might be the first night that you get to confess and to repent. 
I want to say this. Tonight can be that night. Uh, whether you are a non-Christian, confessing, repenting for the first time, whether you're a seasoned Christian in the faith like Judas here who maybe has been harboring sin and bitterness towards a brother and sister, tonight can be that night where you can gather together with brothers and sisters all over the region. And you can come together and you can confess sin and you can repent together and you can find celebration in Christ because you know that through confession, through repentance, through taking communion, that God in his grace and in his mercy is going to build you up to look more and more and more like his son. And in doing so then, he'll actually allow you to be a part of building out his kingdom, advancing his kingdom by his mission. You do that together, your missional communities, man. They're going to look 100% different tomorrow than they look tonight. If you come together in transparency and authenticity as brothers and as sisters, I guarantee you will change as a family between today and between tomorrow. If you come in maybe and you confess pride, ask him, God, I, can you take away this pride and give me humility? Maybe you're coming in and you need to confess that you have betrayed a friend. Then pray for reconciliation and he will give you reconciliation. Maybe you're coming in and it's not pride, but it's insecurity. Just simply asking him to build up in you a security that only he could give to you. Whatever it may be, ask him to reveal what you need to give and then invite him to rebuild that in you. So two questions for you. What does God need to tear down within me? What does God need to build anew within me? And then I want you to take the bread and take the cup, have the elements there in your home, and simply respond through communion just like we do week in and week out. All the while recalling and remembering, this should feel a little uncomfortable. You should feel a little bit of a sting during this time. There should be a momentary discomfort if you're genuinely confessing large aspects of your identity or even small aspects of your identity that keep you from looking more and more like Christ. And in that, recall the gospel, church. Jesus took the hammer and nail so that you can be set free, so that you can be rebuilt in Christ. Communion will give you the opportunity to do that. And so I love you and I'm praying for you. We pray and hope that this video serves you well as a church family during Holy Week. I'm excited to see you tomorrow night, Good Friday service, 5 p.m., 7 p.m. The RSVP has up and available for that. And also excited to see you then Easter services, RSVP are up for all three services. So please feel free to RSVP uh, before we hit capacity in those. Man, we love you. God bless. Take this time serious, man, and enjoy it with Jesus. Have a great night.